Hello, good evening to you wherever you are. Uh, my name is Professor Phil Hubbard. I'm Professor of Urban Studies at King's College London, and I lead the Urban Futures Research Group in the Department of Geography. And down the years, our department has been very heavily involved in studying questions of gentrification in London through the work of people such as Chris Hamnitz, Loretta Lees, Tim Butler, and many others. But a lot of that research, like a lot of UK gentrification research, the emphasis has been very much on identifying cultural and class transitions in the capital, more than it's been on focusing the racialized displacement associated with gentrification. And in that sense, the report we're focusing on today, Push to the Margins, which has been published by the Runnymede Trust and the Centre for Labour and Social Studies, uses a really novel methodology to quantitatively measure the phenomenon of gentrification in very recent years, and to focus on its impact on the multiracial working class in London in the fast, first half of the 2010s. And I think we all realize this study is both timely and important given that black and minority ethnic minorities comprise around 40% of the demographic makeup of London that experience particularly pernicious inequalities in housing and disproportionately live in the most deprived areas of the city. So understanding how and where the defining elements of gentrification, displacement, erasure and neighborhood uplift Understanding where those occur in relation to these areas of multiracial occupation, I think, is vital if we're to distinguish between processes of improvement and renewal on the one hand that benefit all uh, citizens, and on the other hand, the type of regeneration that actually breaks up established multiracial communities. Now, today we're discussing a report that was published last Thursday. It's freely available at the Runny Me Trust uh, website, and in a minute, its author Adam will no doubt provide uh, a, a link to that report as he summarizes it. Adam Almeida is the author of the report. He joined class as a researcher in July 2020 to work with the Running Me Trust on this report. Prior to that, Adam worked as a consultant at the Treatment Action Group and the Overseas Development Institute, completing quantitative analyses of health-related data from programs in the Global South. He's got an MSc in Global Population Health from the LSE, and his dissertation studied the effects of austerity uh, on the Portuguese healthcare system. Adam's going to spend about 20 minutes or so outlining the report, its main findings. Uh, if you've got any questions, I don't have the capacity to turn on your microphones. I realise we're a relatively small group on this hot evening, but rather than uh, trying to turn on your microphones and interject, if I can encourage you to use the Q&A function and we will take and we will discuss any questions or comments that you've got towards the end of the session. Before we do that, however, I've got two uh, excellent discussants who are going to provide uh, their perspective on the issues raised in the report. The first is Patria Roman Velazquez, who is a senior lecturer in media and creative industries at the London campus of Loughborough University, where I used to work. Uh, Patria specialises in communication, migrant economies and urban regeneration, and she's the author of the book The Making of Latin London, Salsa Music, Place and Identity, and she's published very uh, numerous articles on the impact of urban regeneration and planning policy on London's migrant and ethnic economies. Her recent research on the Latin American business clusters in London explores constructions of place and identity in relation to migrant entrepreneurship at times of intense urban change in London. Uh, importantly, she's also the founding chair of Latin Elephant, a charity that aims to increase the participation of Latin Americans in processes of urban change in London. And we'll hear a little bit more about that later. The second response we're going to get to the report is from Nigel de Narona, who's assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Nottingham University. Nigel completed his PhD in social statistics in Manchester in 2016. It was entitled Tenure, Household, Home and the New Urban Landscape, a mixed methods analysis of the changing private rented sector. He taught in the QSTEP uh, quantitative program at the University of Warwick for two years before joining the Department of Human Geography recently at the University of Nottingham. And before studying for his PhD, he worked as a senior performance specialist at the Audit Commission, focusing on equality and cohesion issues. Recently, he's been writing on the issues raised by the COVID-19 pandemic, which have favoured homeowners and landlords much more so than tenants. And he's written about the way that an acceleration in sales and evictions has exacerbated racial inequalities in London's housing market. So I'm really looking forward to hearing these responses uh, once we've heard Adam introducing the report. Uh, before we turn to Adam, I should just say that tonight's uh, discussion is being recorded and we will be hosting it on the YouTube uh, channel of King's. So please look out for that and encourage those who are unable to make it or are otherwise down at the beach or 
they're having a sundowner in the garden to maybe catch up on this at a later uh, date and perhaps share it with the wider communities across London who I think deserve to hear this really important research. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn now uh, to Adam to provide an introduction to the report, Push to the Margins. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Phil, for the introduction. And I just wanna thank uh, King's College as well for hosting tonight's event. Uh, I know it's unfortunate that it's uh, such a gorgeous day outside and that uh, you guys are locked in inside watching this, so I promise to make it as engaging as possible. Um, so just to kind of begin, I wanted to talk about the process of um, how this project came to be and what were the actions that uh, led to the emergence of this work. So uh, back in 2019, in a project that was uh, co-launched by the Runnymede Trust and CLASS, uh, there was a report that was generated called We Are Ghosts, and that was done by two researchers, Delia Snousy and Laurie Mampala. And it sought to break past um, the narratives that were emerging from uh, the British establishment of uh, what was taking place amongst the working class um, in the country. And so what we saw uh, through these different narratives that were being delivered was that there are these two separate groups, the white working class on one side and ethnic minorities on the other side, and that these Two groups are in diametric opposition from one another and exist completely uh, distinct from one another and um, compete for the attention of Westminster or the media or whoever. And the work uh, that was completed in the We Are Ghost report was to better understand what is the shared commonality of experience and develop the understanding of the multiracial working class. So explicitly putting race at the center of um, the working class identity within Britain and understanding that uh, the class composition has been shaped by race since the inception of the British Empire and continues to uh, be borne out in the present day. And the research, the qualitative research was collected in London um, in order to strike back against another narrative that was being delivered by the establishment, which is that uh, London, you know, takes all the resources and all the wealth of the country and leaves behind um, towns um, and post-industrial sites throughout the country and that we're hoarding all the wealth. And it portrays a kind of image of London as um, a beacon of, of privilege and that the streets are lined with gold and all of this kind of stuff. And studying the working class as they live and reside in the city in order to better understand the experience of poverty within the city, which is the experience of one in four Londoners, um, and to better understand how race and class both play uh, a part in that. And so um, gentrification emerged out of the qualitative analysis as an area that um, held a shared resentment amongst the multiracial working class as a loss of communal space um, as well as a disruption to uh, complex uh, kinship networks and familial and community networks that have developed in, in our city's neighborhoods. And so uh, through that kind of discursive analysis and understanding where people are, are sort of thinking about that, this project um, resulted. Um, and so thank you to the uh, funding from Trust for London and continuing on um, in the work, we sought to analyze what is gentrification and how, uh, what are the dynamics of race and class as it pertains to London through the lens of, of gentrification. Um, so the kind of first, um, the first point that we wanted to address with the work is what is gentrification? And I think for many of us, especially in the 2020s, as we've seen the term gentrification migrate out of the halls of academia, which has long been its home for, for many, many years, that it's now becoming a commonplace term. And that, you know, when you say somewhere is becoming, becoming gentrified or is gentrified, that people generally know what you're talking about. And so, um, we sought to kind of measure empirically what is gentrification. And I think probably as many of the people on this call know, you can kind of sense when an area is becoming gentrified, you see the changes over time, especially if it's happening in your own hometown or city um, and start to realize the change of dynamics. But um, the question of how do we empirically measure it 
started to come up. And so I delved into the literature and uh, through the brilliant literature of people like Phil and Nigel and Patria and others uh, began to understand what, what were the core defining features of gentrification. And I think through the work of Dr. Adam Elliott Cooper, who unfortunately couldn't join us for tonight's discussion, but who's such a brilliant mind um, in this field that he really establishes um, displacement as the core defining feature of gentrification. So there is no gentrification without displacement, which means that people have to be pushed out or have to move out in order for gentrification to occur. So as a quantitative researcher, I'm sitting at home on my computer, thinking, okay, how am I gonna measure displacement? And I'm reading articles written by people like Phil and all of this stuff talking about or writing about how complicated it is to, to measure phenomenons of displacement. And so I start looking and, and looking through eviction data and I'm wondering, okay, if I can map out where people are getting evicted, I can see where people are, you know, rent levels are going up and all of this different stuff. And I start to, to scroll through, um, all of the research and um, Omar Khan, who was the previous director of Runnymede, put me in touch with someone named uh, Paul Longley from UCL, who had these two amazing data sets um, that he recommended that I use. So one of the data sets was population churn. So it measured the proportion of people who moved out of a given area within a given time frame. So for the um, um, period of analysis of the report, that time frame is 2010 to 2016, um, and it measures a lower layer super output area, which is um, this kind of 500 household area, and there's about 4,835 LSOAs, as they're called, throughout the city. And so he had all of this uh, data in the CDRC team that he works for, had all of this data um, that measured the proportion, how many people moved out of a given area. And so when you look at it um, and start to see what the range of data is, at the top end, you saw some places like in North Greenwich, where there's giant development, 80% of people have moved out within that six year time frame. Um, and when you look through the rest of the data at the other end, you see areas like Bromley or Sutton, which would be very suburban areas, had 30%. So, you know, I started to realize that there was a, a large difference, especially with inner city neighborhoods and uh, inner London boroughs and outer London boroughs that were more suburban, that had increased home ownership and all of that kind of stuff. And the second data set that was provided by the CDRC was in ethnicity estimator data. Uh, which sounds kind of peculiar and it definitely was to me and I read through all the scholarly articles that they published which were many uh, that broke it down but essentially what the data set did was it paired um, census data with consumer data so from these uh, four privately held um, data sources they tried to find um, people as they appeared in their census uh, form and how they identified in their census form and with their name in order to guess their ethnicity. Um, and, you know, based on the analysis, it had quite a high level of, of correlation of what we saw um, different ethnic groups occupying in different parts of the, the city. So for example, East London looked very Bangladeshi, uh, which was you know, accurate. And you saw high concentration of Bangladeshis in the late nineties, moving from the East End, Spitalfields area, outwards towards Barkingside. And, and you know, that kind of mapped onto the traditional, how we thought of um, these different ethnic groups and how they moved through the city. And so um, with these two group, with these two um, uh, data sets, I began the analysis and paired them together and started to see different patterns as they occurred in the city. And they started to look pretty familiar with my own understanding of gentrification as I had seen it in, in the past number of years that I've been in London. And so, um, with this, I started to add two different uh, data sets as well. So one of them was change in house price, uh, which between the two years and how it changed relative to the borough wide average. So uh, in 2010, if I saw that 
if to give an example, uh, homes in Walthamstow Central were selling for just over 100,000 pounds. And in 2016, they were selling for almost half a million pounds. To me, that signaled that an area was becoming desirable and that there were a lot of homeowners who were looking to buy um, in the area. So a kind of signal that people who are able to buy their homes are more likely to be middle class um, and differ from the, the uh, people in the private rental sector. Um, and the final one, uh, the final metric was indices of multiple deprivation. So uh, this is something that is uh, analyzed and collected um, through the, uh, the English wide. It's an analysis across England. And so as we know that over the 2010s, uh, this was a decade marked by huge spending cuts in the UK, that any market decreases in deprivation, so places becoming healthier, um, is less likely to do with successful government policy and more likely to do with the people who live in deprived conditions moving elsewhere in the city. So when I took all four of these metrics, the population churn, change in ethnicity, um, house price change and indices of multiple deprivation, I kind of combined them all together with different weighting and began to generate these maps and started to see the patterns that looked really familiar to me and spoke with um, you know, uh, people who are involved in grassroots organizations and all of these things. And they started to say, yeah, this looks familiar. And uh, you know, wealthy areas like um, Knightsbridge didn't come up as gentrified, but areas like Bethnal Green and Tower Hamlets that came up as gentrified and started to kind of look like what we think um, and so the, as well with putting the analysis across the entirety of the city, what we also wanted to do with the work was move beyond uh, the kind of anecdotal evidence or the anecdotal stories that are kind of, that are important, but are given a lot of weighting in mainstream media of, uh, you know, this one cafe moving into an area, um, you know, the, um, serial killer cafe in Brick Lane kind of comes to mind as an example of gentrification in the 2010s that people really rebelled in protest against. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to, by putting it across the entirety of the city, track these changes beyond, uh, you know, these changes at, at the street level and these changes that are kind of um, probably identifiable to, to people, but to move beyond the analysis that it's driven by hipsters moving into the area, because I think a lot of the language and the discourse around gentrification has held hipsters and, uh, you know, young up and coming yuppies moving into a neighborhood and, and holding them at the helm for these processes. Um, but by putting them across the entire city and seeing these different patterns taking place, uh, you could see that this was macroscopic, that it was coordinated at a larger level, and that there were systems that were working together in order to make London an increasingly unstable site of working class life. And when you put all, you know, when I put all the, the different analytic, analytical lenses and all these different metrics, uh, what we saw uh, was that when you look at where the proportion of people of color is increasing in London, it's a donut effect. It's in the very center in zone one, where there's an increase in the proportion of, of people in color and in zones four to six, kind of on the outskirts of the city. And when you added the class um, based analysis, the class identifier, the changes in deprivation level and house price change, you just see a circle around the edges. And so what we're seeing is the multiracial working class is being pushed to the margins of the city. And um, it really means that uh, the people who create such a, a core sense of community, uh, who literally run the hospitals that we go to when we're sick, who drive the buses that take us to and from uh, work and to the bar or home or to family and friends, all of these things, the people who run the grocery stores, that all of them are being displaced to the margins of the city. And the people who contribute most to the urban life are the ones who are most removed from it. Um, so by looking at it at, at the kind of macroscopic lens, I wanted to choose some case study examples and to do a deep dive into those areas. And um, 
the case studies that I, sh I chose were Southwark, which is in uh, Southeast London and is bordered by the Thames um, at its nor uh, northern boundary. So very much the core center of London. Um, another borough I chose was Waltham Forest in the Northeast corner and on the border of Essex. So, uh, you know, almost um, quasi suburban um, in some parts of the borough. And then Brent um, in Northwest London, uh, which kind of had a traditionally more middle class area in Kingsbury and Queensbury in the Northwest corner and more working class areas. Um, in the southeast corner in Harlesden and Neesden and um, all of these kinds of areas. And so I wanted to do a deep dive in order to better understand, especially uh, the working class communities of color that existed in each of these areas. And I'm sure Patria is gonna speak a lot about um, the experience of Latinos in South London, in Southwark and their contribution to the area. And so through this analysis and kind of taking a deep dive into these different areas of the city, uh, what we saw is uh, in Southwark, it represented to, um, principally two things, um, council-led demolition and transit-induced uh, gentrification. So the first being large-scale um, estate demolitions where uh, something like 3,000 people from the Haygate estate are displaced out and, um, you know, the work of, um, I'm going to forget, so someone please correct me, I think it's uh, ACORN or London Renters Union, which mapped out uh, the pattern, I could be wrong, um, but saw that people who were uh, moved out of the Haygate estate, moved further to areas that were more deprived, less connected to the center of the city and, and all of this kind of stuff. And so these um, estate demolition, especially in an area with such a high proportion of council residents, uh, which for people who are watching outside of the UK, this means people living in public housing. And um, I believe in 2010, the percentage of people who were living in council housing in Southwark was 45%. So nearly one in two people living here were living in public housing. And so over time, the council has regenerated um, these different estates and what it's triggered. And thank you, Phil, for providing the uh, demolition map um, and a really important website, estatewatch.london. Um, so what we saw is that there's a connection between areas that are hotspots of gentrification and places that council estates used to to um, be uh, used to exist. Um, because subsequently what happens is new housing is built, but it's not for the working class people who are principally residing there, it's to bring new people in. So that was one form of gentrification that was taking place in Southwark. And the second was transit-induced gentrification. So as we saw the overground uh, open and enter into South London with the South London line connecting to the East London line, uh, you saw areas like Peckham and Denmark Hill in, in um, Camberwell all begin a process of gentrification and cluster around those stations um, because it principally connected people in those areas into the heart of the city of London, which is the financial core of the city. And so those were two things that were seen in, in Southwark. And uh, I'm sure Patria will speak more about the experience, specifically the estate um, regeneration and larger regeneration schemes in the area has had on the local Latino population. Um, in Waltham Forest, it also represented uh, transit-induced gentrification. Uh, so the opening of the Chingford line of the overground connected uh, Walthamstow uh, with uh, Liverpool Street in the heart of the financial, um, the financial capital of the city, the core of the city. Uh, where people on average make 90,000 pounds a year, uh, which is about 63% higher or 63% higher uh, than the London wide average. So you're seeing a lot of uh, people on higher salaries moving into these areas um, and becoming better connected in. And the second effect was spillover gentrification. So Waltham Forest was um, bordered by areas like Hackney, Tower Hamlets, and Newham, which all experienced higher gentrification in that time period. And so 
uh, you have uh, working class people first moving out to Waltham Forest and then middle class people moving further out as the process develops along a kind of continuum. And so, you know, as uh, a family might have bought a house in Victoria Park Village, uh, 10 years ago, now they might be buying in Walthamstow Village, further out from the city, uh, but with increased connectivity uh, via transit connections. And the third borough, which gentrified the least of the three, was Brent. Um, and Brent represented also spillover gentrification from areas uh, like Kensington and Chelsea and Ealing and Hammersmith and Fulham and uh, Camden, um, principally in the southeastern corner of the borough. And you're starting to see the pressures that, you know, took over Notting Hill in the 2000s start to move further upwards into new territory. Um, and you start to see um, there, you know, there was an article published, I think it was in the Observer, but I could be wrong. And it's called Kensal Rising. And Kensal Rise is an area in um, southeastern Brent uh, that experienced a lot of gentrification. So, you know, a lot of newcomers coming into the area. Um, and the other hub of gentrification in Brent was in Wembley, where the Wembley Stadium sits and where there's a massive um, regeneration scheme taking place. And so you're seeing the development of a lot of uh, brownfield sites into market rate housing um, and triggering a process of exclusionary displacement, which means that areas which could have been homes for working class residents be developed and market, uh, market marketed for uh, middle class, um, and young professionals who are looking to buy homes, uh, who are, you know, in more professionalized um, occupations um, or occupations with higher salaries. And so all of these different dynamics, um, I kind of um, delved further in on. And um, the final thing uh, that I wanted to kind of shed some light on, especially today with a lot of uh, discussion about what's happening in Nine Elms, which is a neighborhood in Southwest London uh, where the US embassy is, is being built or will soon open is that um, there are things called opportunity areas that are placed around the city and were chosen in 2004 and earmarked as place for development. So these were places with a lot of uh, brownfield sites and capacity to build homes and capacity to build jobs. Um, as well as some of the most deprived places in London. And when it was launched by the mayor of London at the time, Ken Livingston, the idea behind it was we're gonna build these mixed use developments. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get private capital to come in and we're gonna use, siphon off the money in order to put it towards uh, creating uh, public housing for public good and kind of you know use it to finance high quality homes in, in these places that have capacity to build homes. And so, you know, uh, more than 15 years past its, its introduction into the city, we're starting to see more of the effects of, of these different areas. And so what it means to be located within an opportunity area means that mega housing developments that require large infrastructural changes um, and the building of um, either um, commercial areas and housing are kind of put together and are given a green light that probably wouldn't be passed outside of, of these regions. And so using my analysis and going through, I did a, a t-test of, um, is there a difference in gentrification levels within these opportunity areas and outside of these opportunities areas? And definitively, gentrification scores were higher within uh, opportunity areas and uh, population churn, which is being informally measured as um, a metric of displacement, uh, was higher within these opportunity areas. And specifically on using population churn as a measure of displacement, I think another really interesting finding that kind of, you know, uh, shocked me when I saw it, or not shocked me, but uh, kind of justified what I had previously thought is that there's, um, when mapping the correlation between population churn, so the movement of people out of a neighborhood and the subsequent change in ethnicity of that area, we see a strong correlation that the increase of, resi of residents moving out of an area means that the area subsequently becomes more white and less um, multiracial. 
And so what we're seeing is that um, within these opportunity areas, these things like displacement are taking place and that we're seeing homes and, um, you know, uh, public spaces that are built, uh, not for the local community that's long existed there, but um, without them, almost excluding them. Uh, so, you know, these are all things that that have come in uh, to mind. And I think one of the most important ones to talk about, especially with the opportunity areas, is the Olympic uh, regeneration scheme, which was uh, long heralded as this uh, successful use of um, preparing for the 2012 Olympic Games and we're gonna transition these homes into high quality social housing and all of that stuff. And it's really had a knock on effect, especially in East London, but throughout the city. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see something that back in 2004 in preparation for something that occurred back in 2012 is still bearing out in, in the present day. And so um, that was kind of the idea behind um, the analysis that I undertook talk um, and the kind of thinking um, that went into it. So um, at this point, uh, I think it would probably be good to get my co-host to start to speak a little bit about their, their own ideas and uh, their thoughts behind uh, the findings of the work and to also just say thank you for your contributions that made it possible. Thanks so much, Adam. That's really clear. And succinct presentation. It's a wonderful report. I really encourage people to look at it. I know from my own experience that presenting kind of census mapping of gentrification can appear very dry. But the report is anything but that. It's very clear, it's very lucid. And I think by taking the three case studies, you're grounding in particular neighborhoods and locations, and you're highlighting different processes of exclusion. And as you've said, there are different processes going on, there are different forms of gentrification, new build gentrification, particularly in Brent and around Wembley in particular. So that we've got the estate clearances, which I've been researching and you've written about, and we can maybe reflect a little bit more on those later. And then that kind of overspill uh, gentrification occurring in Waltham Forest. So different processes, similar outcomes in terms of exclusionary displacements, not always through forms of eviction or direct displacement, but sometimes by indirect displacement that only manifests itself over generations in some cases. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing many questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to encourage people. I see plenty of people, attendees who I know are embedded in some of these communities or know them well. So I'd start to encourage you, please, please put in some comments, any questions you might have about this report, or any reflections you've got about what this all means for the different ethnicized and racialized communities of London. Think about that. Please pop those into the Q&A and we will get to them. Uh, but before then, I want to turn to, first of all, Patria for some of her reflections on what she's hearing and some of her own thoughts about the consequences of gentrification induced displacement for particularly the Latin communities of London. So over to you, Patria. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I would like first to thank Adam for, for his approach also to this report because um, I just sort of um, commented to him at the beginning, I still remember when, when I met him, you know, at, at protests and he talked to all of those grassroots campaigns and organizations sort of across London. And, and I think we felt very much compelled, consulted through, throughout the process. He also invited us to feedback and preliminary results. And I think um, it, it's great for me, at least was really good and for other grassroots groups that I'm involved with as well, um, to see the results of this feedback, of these discussions sort of being addressed in the report. And, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and I want to highlight from that, that, you know, this is what research with and for our communities looks like. Um, not often researchers come into, into the ground um, and with that sort of approach. But so for that, I really sort of want to thank you. And here I, I, I sort of, you know, shift between um, my role as an academic and my role with Latin Elephant. But I hear I'm talking more about the work. Um, and my experience as a, as a migrant myself, you know, Latin American uh, sort of migrant in London. Um, and, and it was out of, of sort of my research with, with retailers and traders in, in Elephant and Castle, that Elephant, Latin Elephant was formed. And, and as Phil said earlier, Latin Elephant is a charity that is working with migrant ethnic groups um, and in Latin Americans in particular, 
to increase the participation, inclusion and engagement in sort of processes of um, urban change in London. Our work is basically in Southwark. Um, however, we've cut across other areas of London where there are also other big um, Latin American business clusters and BME clusters because we've sort of extended to include most migrant and ethnic um, sort of business uh, clusters or traders in, in, in regeneration sites. So we've worked a bit with Seven Sisters as well, where there's also a big Latin American cluster. And in Brent, uh, we've begun to do um, a bit of mapping there as well, which there's a big um, Brazilian um, business cluster there as well. And Latin Elephant, in a way, advocates for sort of spatial justice, for equality, it sort of scrutinizes policies um, and particularly planning policies that have a negative impact on, on, on London's BME communities. It challenges um, sort of regeneration programs that very much have talked, um, have, have resulted in what, in what Adam was saying about the displacement, the fragmentation of our communities. Um, and the Latin American uh, population in particular is seeing three big business clusters sort of completely dismembered and, and, and fragmented and, and that loss of, of space, um, of community uh, reunion, of convivial sort of spaces. Um, it, it's really felt hard in, 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 in our sort of communities. Um, and, 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 and I do feel that we're experiencing a sort of gentrification that is very much developer led, but also aided by um, sort of local and regional sort of uh, governments in, in a way. And I feel that this type of um, sort of regeneration that leads subsequently to gentrification is very much creating segregated spaces, it's privatizing what was uh, ordinarily public spaces, um, but it's also decimating our sort of communities um, and, and, and communities across London, not, not just the Latin American community. And I feel that this type of developer led gentrification that is also aided by local governments tend to magnify in very concrete ways, you know, via its practices, but also through its physical structures. What are um, uh, what is economic, social, and sort of racial inequality in our cities? Um, and, and in Latin Elephant, when we began uh, our research and our campaign, um, we always said um, that it's not change what we're opposed to because we were always accused that oh, you know, communities don't want change, and it's not change that we opposed to. Um, we kept saying it is this form of regeneration that that one that doesn't benefit our communities, the one we oppose. But it's not change, and don't confuse one with um, sort of the other. Um, and after six years of sort of campaigning, um, the work and working with uh, traders in, in, in Elephant and Castle and together with other local groups, we achieved um, substantial sort of gains for the traders, you know, we, uh, uh, together with 35%, um, the number of socially rented um, units were, were, were increased. Um, affordable spaces for traders in the new town center was also achieved, a relocation fund of nearly um, 800,000, um, 15 year sort of affordable rent levels, a panel, a traders panel, amongst other, you know, community gains. Um, we've managed to relocate 60% of the traders um, that were in the shopping center, and we're still fighting for um, sort of some market traders that are still without being relocated. And one of the things that I want to highlight here is that every little gain that Latin Elephant and other groups involved in the campaign for Elephant and Castle um, that, that, that was achieved had to be fought hard. None of the gains um, achieved came firsthand. Um, what got us where, where we are at the moment was the type of evidence that we produced. Um, our sort of participatory approaches to engagement, being part of the communities we work with, and a very concerted campaign that included protests, social media, advocacy, and much more. Um, and the Latin American community, as I said, has experienced a loss of community space, a convivial space. And this is um, sort of compounded with COVID, with Brexit, and it's like, it's hit us triple, you know, regeneration, COVID, Brexit. 
and it has really hit us hard and it has hit our communities really, really hard. So the report comes at a really timely um, um, moment for us. It will make our case um, stronger at, at, at a local level, at the lo level of the borough, but also um, a pan-London sort of level. We can no longer be told that our evidence is just anecdotal as if, well, you know, lived experience is not enough. But we now have, and thanks to this report, the evidence that we need to support our argument that regeneration and subsequently gentrification sort of disproportionately and negatively impacts BME and other disadvantaged groups. This has been an argument that I've been sort of spelling out since the very beginning, but had no way of proving it in the way that Adam so neatly does in this report. And from the report, what I want to highlight is three things that I think are the most useful for us as community groups. Um, um, and I want to, I think one of the things that, that the report does is that it demonstrates that gentrification disproportionately impacts BME communities across London. Um, it, it does focus on gentrification through the lens of, of race and class. Um, and, and, and that Latin elephant, you know, we know what it is to live at the margins and, and to be further pushed to the margins. Um, we, we consistently sort of argued that gentrification disproportionately impacts BME groups. So, so in a way, what this report is going to do is going to make us stronger with that argument, we now have that evidence um, that, that, that sort of proves what we experience firsthand. Um, gentrification also when, when you are, you know, from a migrant sort of community, also equates in a way to a loss of a shared history in our migratory sort of trajectory. Um, so, so, so what it means to belong, you know, to different places, to make home in our different places, uh, and then suddenly to be sort of uh, uh, fragmented yet again, um, displaced yet again. So, so when I say we know what it is to be pushed to the margins, uh, you know, uh, I mean it in terms of our experience as well. Um, our, our communities are being priced out of areas. Um, they have um, sort of settled here in, in new places, they've invested economically, emotionally, um, and then of course they're uprooted yet again. So, 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 so the report just very clearly demonstrate that. Um, the second aspect that I want to sort of point at is, um, and, and is another point that grassroots groups have been consistently sort of going on about and fighting in a way against um, this uh, designation of opportunity areas. Um, I, I keep saying, you know, regeneration and this developer-led regeneration is the antithesis of, of sort of spatial justice. Um, and, and, and I think that the report very much captured what well, you know, local governments for long has been sort of um, long leasing public land to corporate capital um, to faci and facilitating local planning sort of policies to facilitate these developments. And the opportunity area is one clear example of that. Um, and we constantly said list being listed as an opportunity area comes at a high price for, for BME groups, the working class and other minor, minoritized sort of communities. So I think the report captures this really, really well. Um, and, 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 and I'm glad that, that you managed to, to, to draw some parallels there with, with your evidence. Um, and another aspect that I think, you know, and you explained it really well today as well, Adam, um, it's it, it's this cross referencing between different data sets that you have and bringing this data together, you can uncover who is gentrification pushing out. Um, and you couldn't have done it more convincingly. Um, together, this data sort of uncovers where regeneration and gentrification is occurring, who the newcomers are, who's being pushed away, um, and at the expense of who is gentrification happening. Um, and this is a very pertinent question that I think you ask in that in that report, and that you managed to answer very convincingly through this bringing all these data sort of together. Um, the, the, the report also, I think what, what is significant in a way is that it captures the rate and the pace or the speed at which this type of regeneration is happening across London. Um, and, and, and it 
very much confirms that BME communities, um, what BME communities have been experiencing firsthand for a very long time. Um, a lot of the policies and the programs to sort of ameliorate or mitigate you know, the negative impact that regeneration have on local groups um, in a way hides and the root causes of economic, social and racial inequality in our cities. And I think that sort of looking forward, you know, we support the recommendations being made in this report. And we sort of believe that if addressed, they will begin to address the spatial inequalities in our cities. And um, I do want to later on come up and think about, you know, what does this mean then for a post sort of COVID city and, and the circumstances upon which we are now, but for now I leave it here. Thanks so much indeed. Really interesting reflections there on racial justice. And also the notion that gentrification in many cases is state led, which I think is something that comes out really clearly in the report. Again, some of you will know the areas that uh, Patria is talking about. And again, if you've got any comments or questions, please put them in the Q&A. We will, I hope, have time to come back to them. For now, though, I want to move on to Nigel. Nigel, if I can invite you to uh, bring some thoughts forward as to what this all means from your perspective. Thanks. OK, um, so um, I'm not from London, so I'm not so familiar with the struggles there, which is it's kind of interesting because sitting in Manchester, we have quite active um, things going on about gentrification here and, and parts of the city being transformed. And I think the stories are probably quite similar. Um, so it would be interesting at some point to think about what's common and what might be different about, about what's happening here. But I suppose I kind of pick this up and um, I agree, you know, Adam, it's a great piece of work, and Patria, your contributions about the state were really good. So I'm trying to kind of add something here and just to pick up on the idea of shifting tenure. So one of the things that struck me on reading the report was the loss of social housing between 2010 and 2016. So Adam, you pulled that up in every section I read, and it was like 50% of social housing has disappeared. Um, so what does that mean? What, what's going on? Is, um, well, so that's disappeared, but what's replaced it? And what I think has replaced it is um, the opportunity by, for financial investment for different types of people. So for financialization. So it's not that we've shifted from social housing to private ownership. It's that we've shifted from social landlords to private landlords. And the major difference between those two types of landlords is the amount of profit they extract from people living in their property. So I think that's a really significant kind of element of the report. And I think it's, if we kind of look back and say, how complicit is the state in this shift? We can look back recently, but if we look back to the eighties, they were talking about mixed tenure investments. Uh, mixed, mixed tenure estates and the idea that you couldn't have more than 40% of people from uh, in social housing in a particular space. So having applied that logic to Hume, a district in Manchester, what they did was shift from 85% rented, all in social housing, to 85% rented, 45% in private renting which obviously increased the profit being extracted from Hume as a place where people live, but actually is kind of a big part of the story. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about, and this is kind of one of the things that um, you've picked up in reading what we've done, is about the whole idea of the hostile environment and the not only the um, potential to exclude people because of their legal status, but the potential to exclude them because of their perceived legal status. So the idea of discrimination that operates because people look or sound foreign and the extent to which that will uh, create the kind of red line of the 50s and 60s, which happened in parts of London, in parts of our other cities, when migrants came and look for housing and were being particularly excluded in particular districts and kind of pushed into others. Um, and I think that, that again, is um, 
I suppose the argument I will make here is that this is part of a continuous struggle, which in terms of resisting um, housing inequality, gentrification, we need to account, take account of the people who are being targeted by these particular hostile um, activities. And that does include all of the action on citizenship that has been experienced by people. And looking towards the future is likely to be experienced by people who are here from Europe who may well have different sets of rights or their rights may become more, far more conditional than they have done so far. And the last thing I would like to kind of pick up on is um, kind of a little bit of what Patrick was saying about what happens post COVID, but just looking at data about what people intend to do. And I'm not gonna make claims that this is representative of the country because I think it's, though it's a national survey, um, it, I, I have some issues with whether it's representative, but a quarter of the people responding plan to move. And 95% of those moves are positive ones. I.e. people are making choices to go to bigger places, to different places, to downsize because that's the point where they are in the life course. And I think that that kind of level of intention to move is pretty phenomenal. And, and what that is gonna create and what it appears to be creating from the way the, the papers hype it up is kind of hyper property markets in places that people see as desirable. So, you know, the Guardian tends to pick on Cornwall. I don't know why, maybe it's a nice train ride. Um, but the, the idea that places that we live or working class people live are quite attractive probably to people who have more money and therefore the kind of push for a different form of gentrification a different type of housing solution in new spaces may well kind of resurface or surface as a result and i think that's a kind of we don't know what what that will look like but i think it's an interesting space uh, to try and get ahead of the curve and understand where we need to resist those kind of challenges to people's right to live, right to adequate housing. Thank you. Terrific, thank you so much. I think that gives us a really important reminder that the processes we're looking at are not just embedded in London, it's not just financialization of housing that's occurring in London, it's occurring in other lucrative property markets up and down the UK. And I think what you've just said resonates really nicely with work I've done over the last 15 years or so in places like Margate, where we see in you know, post lockdown, we see increasing numbers of uh, Londoners or DFLs, as they're called down in Kent, moving to Margate and displacing uh, multiracial communities that in some cases have embedded there after having been displaced from London itself 10 or 15 years before. And again, I think what we talked about in our research around London with the demolition of council estates, resulting in the displacement of up to 150,000 council tenants since 1997. I know that we see that also in the Northwest and we see it not, you know, we, we're not just talking in Manchester terms about the gentrification of uh, you know, fallow fields or the Northern Quarter or New East Manchester. We're also talking about council estates being replaced by private housing, rental housing, town housing in Rochdale, Bolton, Burnley. And some of these actually, these places at the moment are pretty resilient in, in property terms. Uh, they've seen much smaller falls in property prices than, than Greater Manchester, as, as Manchester City Centre, Liverpool City Centre, Glasgow City Centre, and so on. So thank you for that, Nigel. Thank you, Patria. Um, we have got some questions, but before we go on to those, I just want to, you know, not take up too much space with my own research, but one thing that in our research that I did, this is with Adam Elliott Cooper and Loretta Lees, we looked at the demolition of council estates around London. And one thing that we constantly heard about those council estates, and we looked at council estates in, in Haringey, in Barking, and indeed in Southwark, particularly the Aylesbury estate, one thing we constantly heard was that this gentrification is affecting the white working class as much as it is BME populations. But from that perspective, the consequences, however, are markedly different. And one thing that we need to reflect on there, I think, is that for white working class residents, for example, the Aylesbury estate or the Hage estate in, in Southwark, they may be rehoused in Southwark or a surrounding borough, and they may be moving to a place 
which in a sense reflects their identity, their community, in the sense that they're moving to another white majority area. For a, a family of colour, for a BME population or household, that means that they're moving from a multiracial community to a dominant white community, where they may well feel out of place. So I guess what's at stake there isn't just the loss of a home or the ability to stay in place, the right to remain. It's about the breakup of a multiracial community. And as Patrick talked about, that's about community facilities. It's about shops. But in Southwark, it's also about, and I think, Adam, you talk about this in the report, um, faith. I'm thinking about how many, for example, African churches there are in Southwark. I believe in the report you, you talk a little bit about that. So I just wonder, can you say a little bit more about what's at stake here in terms of the displacement? Why does it matter if a BME family is forced to move to a neighbouring borough? So I think it's a really interesting question. First of all, to pick up on the note of um, African congregations in Southwark, I can literally see an African congregation outside my bedroom window in Southwark. So, you know, it's highly pertinent. And all of these things that um, I think Patria speaks about so well is that these community hubs exist and build resiliency in communities that people are able to access not only housing and learn about housing through these, but employment opportunities and um, medical care, who in the area speaks Spanish, who speaks Twi, who speaks Cantonese, how do I get these services, you know, all of this kind of stuff and a lot of this stuff is informalized and I think that's why I wanted one of the um the um, policy recommendations to speak about the community assets that are already here that are often ignored by councils and developers as unimportant. Uh, you know, when I walk from Elephant and Castle tube station and I walk outside and I see a Visos with uh, all the different listings of, you know, this is where to find a job and this is where to all in Spanish. It reminds me of the stories that my parents used to tell me about um, the Portuguese cultural center in Toronto, where they grew up and where they saw this, where you found out this, this stuff. So having that embedded in a local community and that I think what's beautiful about London is that people have so much pride in where they're from, like people are so proud of where they're from. And, um, you know, someone like Delia, who did the research for the We Are Ghost report, spoke to me about how people in North Kensington were offered a council flat on the other side of Kensal Rise in, in Brent. And mothers would say, no, my kids are Kensington kids. Like they're North Kensington kids. They're not Kensal Rise kids. And you know, all of these different, there's a pride in a community that comes and that each area is distinct and very, very different from one another. So I think that that displacement um, disproportionately affects people of color in London because um, these kind of informalized and precarious uh, methods in order to gain um, a foothold in British society are through these, these community things. Um, you know, another friend in Haringey spoke about, I think it was um, the Tunisian or uh, some North African community that there was some cafe in green lanes that people would go directly from the airport from Algeria to the cafe and that's where they would find the information and in a lot of the ways it's quite sad because these small often unpaid or very meager paid or informal spaces are doing the job of the state which is providing people with housing opportunities and medical care and employment all of this stuff right so it's actually quite interesting and i think that kind of bears out specifically on communities of color and i also want to come back to one more point that i think is kind of lacking and i think phil you we've discussed this in the past and this has come up throughout this year of research is that i think a lot of the analysis of gentrification in london focuses disproportionately on the class identifier that this is social cleansing and that I think North American contexts um, do a much better job of putting race into the agenda that this is not only a social cleansing process rooting out the working class from um, the centers of urban life but it's also a racialized process that um, that this exists within our neighborhoods and I think the example of an elephant and castle um, to uh, you know, nightclubs right beside each other, Distriandina on one side, and um, I'm forgetting the other one. Uh, Patria will remember. Is it Corsica? 
Corsica Studios. So Distriandina has a much higher Latino community, more working class. Uh, Corsica Studios is more white, more middle class. And in the development, who does the developer choose to take on? Corsica Studios. And who's left out? Distriandina. So these are the ways that it's also racialized. And I think a lot of the discourse about gentrification, specifically in Europe, misses the racial analysis of it. And that this is an integral part to how things like uh, what Nigel was discussing, hostile environment, play into our local communities and um, are really experienced. Yeah, right. I mean, I think in our research, which was relatively limited, we interviewed 120 households who have been displaced. The majority were BME. Um, what we constantly heard was a discourse that we're being moved on, not because we're working class, but because we are black. And it was seen as a racialized uh, displacement. And if it was about class injustice, that was articulated through a language of race, which isn't necessarily reflected in a lot of the mainstream literature on gentrification in the UK. And Nigel, I don't know how much this resonates with your research at all. I mean, do you want to reflect at all on what's lost when BME populations are broken up? Um, I suppose that, I, yeah, I wouldn't add a lot more to what Adam was saying. I mean, I, I would say that um, gentrification does affect everyone. And I, I think one of the things we haven't mentioned there is kinship ties. So the idea that this is a disruptive to a family and um, the potential change in housing is particularly disruptive to some families. I think over time, we can go back and look at different case studies about levels of racism that people experience for being displaced or being housed in particular places. Uh, we can look at community facilities and community infrastructure. Um, I mean, looking at what is kind of, I understand happens in, Greater Manchester in terms of minority populations is there is a gradual kind of merging into surrounding areas, but there are still kind of community bases that have kind of, you know, particular facilities, I suppose. So if I think of the Bangladeshi community, there's a kind of natural home in a part of um, South Manchester, um, though the community has spread out quite widely. So um, I suppose I'm not as familiar because we haven't seen a massive estate clearance, or I wasn't in Manchester or don't understand the estate clearance of the 60s or the slum clearance of the 60s, um, which is possibly the point at which those kind of community, that kind of community impact was felt. Um, but I don't think it's far away. I mean, at the moment, gentrification in Manchester seems to be working on brownfield sites and on arterial routes to make places look better, but to hide the housing behind them. I think it's not long before some of the estates will be coming up um, for change. Um, I suppose the better ones have already gone on the, on the right to buy. Right to buy. Um, so it's hard to see from where I'm sitting, but I can, I'm hearing things from Rochdale, for example, about uh, clearing parts of Rochdale, clearing parts of the social housing in Rochdale and uh, developing resistance to that. Um, strange plans in Stockport about investing in lots of kind of office block conversions and so on. So it just feels like we're a bit behind the game in this kind of estate clearance plans. So yeah, that was a bit rambling. Um, so I do think, I mean, to summarize, I think there are commonalities that we experience whether we are white or black, but I think there are additional pressures on BME communities for in specific ways, depending on the ties they have to the places that they're living in. And I think that's probably far more noticeable in London because of the kind of moving population. The fact that London is a much more um, mobile city where lots of people are coming and going. Thank you. Yeah, I think some of the things you're, you've said there about the Bangladeshi community, for example, resonate uh, in our research in uh, the Ocean Estate just off the Mile End Road. There has been redevelopment, there's been demolition. A large proportion of Bangladeshi population has returned, but it's returned to an estate that is not the same. The flats are held on a different tenure. The flats are smaller than they were before. And that means that many extended families have been broken up 
they're now living on different parts of the estate and some people have had to move out. So you get that kind of the kinship ties that might be important, extended households and so on, have been broken up as well. So I think that resonates with what you're saying there about kinship and, and, and the importance of kind of social and community capital. Uh, Patria, you've spoken quite a lot already, I guess, about the importance of community hubs. I don't know if there's anything else you want to uh, talk about in relation to that. I think um, what I want to highlight is, um, you know, we, we also um, published um, a, a sort of little report highlighting the sort of socioeconomic value of Elephant and Castle with some Susie Hall who's done a lot on, on, on migration and the high street as well. Um, and migrant economies, and 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 I think this is also captured in, in in the report, which is you know moving away from from just economic value, and and, and I think I've sort of written about this. If we're just going to be valued upon, you know, land is being such a privilege as an economic resource, but not as a social um, and cultural sort of resource. So if if you're going to put just land as profit and 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 completely ignore and make invisible that sort of social and cultural sort of um value that the, our communities bring then you know we're, we're going to be losers to the end and i think you know we need a very different approach to how we're going to value um and put value into what contribution our communities bring and you know my research has been mainly with um sort of that, that sort of aspect of retail gentrification but one of the things that we have which you've written as well um quite quite a lot but one of the things that i think my 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 sort of work brings is putting this racial dimension into um, gentrification in the UK, which you, you hardly um, sort of see it, which in the United States you see it more. And for example, there's a, a, a group of people talking about Latin urbanisms. And so some, some of those things we also uh, brought here and, you know, um, structures and buildings are not void of cultural markers and, and, and ethnic and racial markers. You know, we know that different styles of architecture and the way we plan cities are embedded and imprinted with these things um and so 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 what cost are we losing the distinctiveness of our cities and and because of of this generic form of gentrification that values only profit that doesn't value the distinctiveness of of, of what we bring as culture not just in terms of um uh, the culture that we bring but also the the sort of um uh, colors, the vibrant sort of atmospheres, the music, the sounds, the smells, the the, the structures are very different. You know, um, we, we have a Chinatown, we have different, so 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 structures are not void of ethnicity, you know, or of cultural markers, if 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 you want, they're not called, they're not void of, of 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 this distinctiveness that makes cities, um, in a way, slightly different. And I want to sort of highlight. Um, of that, you know, it's about policies, it's about practices, it's about structures and how we merge all of that to think of these um, communities and their contribution. Um, another, I think, aspect that I wanted to highlight here was, is in relation to opportunity areas, which I also think there's a racial dimension here, because when you look at most of the opportunity areas that are listed, over 40% of the population identifies having a BME background. And all, uh, 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 all of them tend to be highly unequal in terms of the disparity between rich and poor, like Southwark has, you know, <laughs> as well, and um, where the indices of deprivation are really high as well. So all of these opportunity areas have these characteristics in common, or most of them do. So there is a racial dimension. There is a class dimension here very much linked. And, and I think um, we need to start thinking how this transpires into the policies that these governments are making. How are they designating these opportunity areas? And, and those are the, some, some of the issues I want to sort of sort of highlight and in, in, in how racialized policies are even though you're not necessarily using it you know in, in, in Britain I find you know contrary to some other experiences I have with other sort of countries when I look at policies these policies are really nice you know they're, they're really worded nicely that you don't have these racial undertones and so on but it is in the practice is when you start digging in and, and and the implications of these policies that then you see the practice the structures and all coming together and 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 making it a very racialized sort of um, issue. 
um, no, and I, I'm really glad that you've put this in, 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 in another form of evidence to put this because mine has been really qualitative and, and, and yours has been um, highly quantitative in that respect. So I think it's, it's really good to have that combination of, of, of material and supporting each other's argument in, in that respect. So no, thanks. Okay, we've got a few questions. We've got about 15 minutes or so. so. Let's see if we can crack through some of these. Apologies if we don't get around to all of them. Um, anonymous attendee, I think has asked questions twice. They may be different people, but I'm gonna try and bracket these together and it may be that Adam wants to respond. Another form of gentrification is football-induced gentrification. Um, the Tottenham Hotspur, Haringey development linked into the HDV, Haringey development vehicle. We know that there's been major redevelopment resistance around Love Lane. Uh, community we've worked with. Um, is there anything to say about football related gentrification and its impact on uh, BME populations? And related to that, why not Haringey? I don't know, Adam, if you can very briefly reflect on that. I think it's probably worth saying that in the report, there are appendices yes. where you go through, I think, every borough, but maybe you could just say a quick word about Haringey and why that wasn't a focus. For sure. Um, just in terms of having to deep dive into a couple, the reason I chose Southwark, I'm going to be honest, because I live here. And uh, Waltham Forest was because Faisa Shaheen was helping and she grew up in Walthamstow and in Chingford. So that kind of contributed and actually through conversations with Patria, talking about Brent and what was going on there. And I, I know that there are a lot of um, multiracial communities that are happening there. So, but everything's in the appendix. There's Herringay and um, all of that down there. Um, and specifically gentrification is clustered in Green Lane, so very Kurdish area, Turkish area, um, as well as Tottenham Hale, uh, large black area, um, and a lot of different communities. So the other thing, I actually have been thinking about this a lot throughout the duration of the project, and I'm thinking the connection between like the Olympic regeneration of East London and footballs. And I feel like there's something to be said about this nationalism, the national you know, clamor that this has to do for something higher than above all of us that we all kind of worship. Like, you know, we want the Tottenham redevelopment to be good. We want the best stadium and football fans will support a new stadium to kind of show off and all of these new tech things. Um, but that in reality, as Phil's research does really well with the Loveling Estate up in uh, Tottenham or um, Carpenter's Estate in uh, Newham in, in that Olympic area is that I feel like there's some relationship occurring between uh, nationalism and gentrification and that this is seen as British assets. And I think that this is also seen with the Wembley Stadium, that these are the things that we want to show off as a nation to others to show our, our wealth at a time when uh, spending cuts have, have cut our communities dry and have caused uh, premature death and these horrific things that these kinds of things, I believe that these kinds of regeneration and regeneration in in um, in in general, is really just a way of showing a veneer of wealth while the people inside are are starved and um, their livelihoods are crumbling and, and extremely precarious. So I feel like there's something there, but I haven't fully thought it through. But uh, yeah, there's definitely a relationship. Thanks, and I mean again, just so you would not. Uh point all the blame at that uh, Super League aspirant Tottenham Hotspurs, I should add as well, that around the London Stadium, I know that many of the residents we interviewed at the Carpenters Estate would testify that on a Saturday afternoon when West Ham fans are passing through, it's not a particularly uh, nice place to be living at the moment in terms of you know, the local pubs out of bounds, uh, fans are urinating in your front garden, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there are obvious impacts of sporting led regeneration on local communities. Okay, got another question, I think, from uh, Alexander Salem. Alex asking about, well, the 2021 census, we're going to have questions on gender, but also sexual identity as well. Um, once we've got the kind of those metrics, we might be able to think about intersectionality. Is there, I mean, this is a bit speculative in a sense, but is there anything we might be able to say about the impact of BME displacement in terms of for example, the emergence and the uh, sustainment of a kind of LGBTQ 
uh, communities of color, Latinx, music venues, Elephant and Castle, and so on and so forth. I mean, I guess we could talk about gender separately from sexuality, but I wonder if any three of you have got any, any reflections and questions of LGBTQ representation issues in the BME population and how that might be affected by gentrification. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'm definitely curious to, to see what the impact is. And I think it's a really astute uh, observation that we're getting this new data at a time when, um, you know, um, gender and uh, sexual minorities are being counted. So it'll be interesting. I think a lot has been written specifically about uh, gentrification in places like Soho, the kind of traditional heart of the gay community in London, but also in new areas such as uh, Vauxhall, which is also marked within the opportunity area. So that might be an interesting frontier. And I'm wondering if this is something that I've just personally been thinking about, but a relationship between more informalized spaces for queer, um, queer culture. So you're seeing a movement away you know, there's the shutting of gay clubs and bars and uh, throughout the city, but that a lot of these things are migrating to one night at this place, or we're going to take over this one place. And so it's almost playing into that kind of precariousness that was originally in, in the We Are Ghost report, the, the predecessor to this report is that the four P's of power, place, uh, prejudice, and precariousness. So I feel like that also has an impact on, on, um, gender and sexual minorities and I know that uh when I was in Tokyo I saw it in the area of Nichome that this was there was a tourism-led gentrification a lot of hotels were being built in the area because the state government doesn't want to support you know um gender expression and uh sexual expression in the same way and I could see it in my own uh hometown of Toronto in um in the gay village uh at church in Wellesley so I think it's a really interesting question yeah thanks for yeah. your uh, question Alex sorry Nigel I was gonna say I think it's a really interesting question I suppose that the, the census is only going to tell us about where people live and my understanding of the way the community lives in um, Greater Manchester is that there are places uh, that are more public spaces. So I think we can probably see impacts as they're taking place now. So my kind of understanding of the gay village in Manchester is that it's being commercialized significantly, that it's become a place for people to go and be tourists in, as opposed to a space that was kind of created um, to support a group of people um, and that those places will emerge so I'm not sure the census will add us add much more um, to what we understand because I'm not sure residential choice is what creates a kind of gay LGBTQ plus space I think we might find more evidence of that looking in our kind of institutions how our universities operate and how public space kind of operates and events in public space. Yeah, right. I mean, that really, uh, again, that echoes some of the research that's been done by Ben Campkin and Laura Murray on the gentrification of queer nightlife in London, and that report's downloadable from UCL. So I think that doesn't look so much at residential patterning, which will come through the census, but about the gentrification of commercial nightlife spaces. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that, Alex. Um, I think we need to move on. I've got a, a question from Bethan Prosser, I think it's in Brighton. Hi, Bethan. And she's saying, in her own research on the seaside towns on the south coast, she gets a sense that the participants uh, in her research that as people move out of London, these towns are becoming more multiracial. How far does the donut that we talked about earlier extend? How far do the margins go or could go? Um, I mean, this is a big question. And one of the big challenges, I guess, in terms of data is finding out where people move to and patterns of migration. We can't always get that from the sources that we've got. But again, just return to you perhaps, Adam, in terms of a technical question. When you stop at the edge of London, what's missed out? What's happening just beyond the edge of London? 
Well, actually, I was going to say I'm, I'm probably not too equipped to answer because the edge of London is like the edge of humanity for this uh, report. I, you know, it's like an island floating. So I, I would be really interested to see where they move to and hopefully some future work um, would start to show that. But I think, Phil, your work on on uh, seaside towns and uh, gentrification outside of of London is interesting, especially with Margate that we talked about is being called shortage on sea, which is, you know, for people outside of London, shortage is a very gentrified part of East London that we're now seeing young creatives moving out to those areas, what's going to happen subsequently and whether, you know, um, the same methods of private capital that cause gentrification in London are going to follow out into the home counties and on into our seaside towns and accelerate as middle class people move out of London. But I, I don't know beyond London. I I had to stick to my 32 boroughs and the city of London in order to gain sanity. Yeah, I think in our research, what we found is it's not a kind of, you know, do not pass go move from London to Margate, Hastings. It's not been that kind of pattern. It's been a gradual kind of centrifugal movement from inner London to outer London and then potentially over time to further places but what I do know I mean even again rather anecdotally is that places I know quite well in North Kent, uh, Dartford Gravesend but particularly the Medway towns which are cheaply commutable now by crossrail but also by coach as well and there are large numbers of students, key workers who come in by coach every day disgorging around Victoria Station because by coach because they can't afford the train fare so in some senses, their move out of London has been because they've been priced out. OK, we just a few more minutes left. Um, a big question, but I think it's, it's the one that perhaps we ought to be addressing. It's a question from Simon Lamb in terms of national policy and legislation. And I don't know how that might intercept with local governance. What are the levers we, that should be pushed and what interventions could we recommend that can tackle gentrification in London? Um, I guess, again, Adam, you've got five suggestions in your report. I don't know if you very quickly want to go through those and then we have a response to those. Well, I was actually going to say Patrio might be able to speak more of the grassroots experience um, and understanding which policies, because uh, the opportunity areas that came up during a roundtable discussion that we had. So uh, maybe Patrio can take it. If you want, I'm, I'm also happy. No, uh, yeah, it's fine. I'll try and address some of these. Um, so in terms of the recommendations and perhaps looking forward, I think um, you mentioned rent control, which could be at both. I think that's a really um, interesting sort of proposition in terms of, 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 of um, the recommendations that, that the report sort of um, highlights and I think that would be really really important because one of the things that push both residents and commerce from London is it's it's, it's rent levels a lot of the time and also um, you know the much more control over this um, because they're also sort of exploitative landlords and and, and all of that so there needs to be much more control at that level um, for our community to sort of be able to continue you know living in in, in, in the center of cities and, and 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 living where they work as well because this is where people also work um, in terms of the the recommendations or other um, thing that I think we need that, I, that that you sort of also captured very well is this focus on the socio sort of economic value and 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 sort of moving away from uh, only economic metrics and and I also think that will make a huge difference to how city centers and town centers will be managed and 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 develop if we have another measure. Um, another issue that you also mentioned that I think you take this from discussions also in Just Space, which is another of the networks, which is on the social um, impact um, assessments, social, uh, which I also think that for our communities, um, that is important because it captures that socioeconomic um, value. Um, so I think those for, for me are very crucial and, and for the grassroots groups that I sort of are involved in. Um, and I think you capture, yeah, a lot of those discussions that we have in, the, in, in that discussion 
um, uh, with, with with other groups um, uh, in terms of the recommendations of, of of things. When I said it at the beginning, you know, um, you you sort of consulted us, you work with us, and and the evidence is there for us to use. So this report, I think, is really timely. It's really good for us in terms of the data it presents, but also in terms of the recommendations. And I think you know now looking forward as well in terms of of of, of COVID, I. I feel that we we are in a in a, in a in a, hopefully at the crossroads of, of thinking differently about our town centres and that this neoliberal sort of approach to cities need to change to how we manage our town centres are and how streets those empty spaces there's a lot to talk about now right about how are we going to use them where community is at the heart right we've always been there you know. <laughs> We've always been there, and this is what it's also um, significant of this report. We've been largely invisible, to quote um, um, Kathy McIlwain, who's also um, from Kings and works with Phil and is the trustee of Latin Elephant as well. Um, but 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 we've been there, and I think it's about recognizing that we're there, that we contribute, and that this is our opportunity to sort of take advantage of the moment to thrive. And with the right support, our communities will do it, and 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 will make thriving centers like we've always had. You know, um, it's just that it's not acknowledged, it's not valued because it's profit and economy over social cultural value. And I think those are the recommendations that for me, um, as, as, as being working, you know, with Latin Elephant and other groups um, are very important. So thank you for that. <laughs> Nigel, I don't know if you've got anything to add there, because in a sense you were talking about financialization, housing as an asset class, and from the perspective of Manctopia, if people have seen that documentary, you can't stop this, can you? You can't stop gentrification. What are, what are the policy solutions from your perspective? Um, well, I suppose one of the things I've learned from, from my brief career in um, doing my PhD is that policymakers don't listen a lot. Um, they're not reasonable, they don't engage. Um, and I did go down to the Ministry for Housing and Local Government towards the end of 2019 and, and kind of had a very similar experience to talking to the new economy in Manchester. So I, I think the message from me would be that the way to um, force policy change is by active resistance. And for me as an, a researcher, that means my role is to support that by providing evidence to those who are active on the ground, rather than trying to get into lobbying a kind of government that clearly isn't listening very much um, about housing policy. So if you look at the significant changes that I've come across, come about with housing policy, a lot of them have been driven by direct resistance. And we can go back, maybe 1915, the Glasgow rent strikes or the freezing of rent, it was frozen again at the um, start of the Second World War to avoid similar resistance. Squatting was legal after the Second World War to accommodate people. So we can see many acts of resistance that have kind of led to the ways we use property differently. Um, and I suppose as an academic with maybe not that much longer to go doing it, that's where I would put my efforts into supporting people who are active on the ground. That's great. I think that your, uh, your comments there echo Patris, I think, about the importance of activism and community-led resistance. Um, we're running out of time with a couple of other comments, which I don't think we're going to have time to get to. I'm... As I said at the start, this session has been recorded. It will go on King's YouTube channel and we will share that link with all the participants who registered. Please share it through your networks because I think this report is important and it deserves to be read. There's a link to that report there. Please circulate it amongst your friends, colleagues, communities, students, and make sure it gets read widely. Adam, do you have any final words at all you would like to finish with about the work? Uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity and for anyone who sat through beautiful weather to listen to us, but it's, um, it's really, it's nice to come full circle, especially, um, 
you know, coming to the city at a young age and learning from people like Patria and, and reading all of your work. So it's such an honor to be seated virtually among you all and um, to be producing something. And I completely agree. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that this message and, and the report and its findings can make its way through the grassroots and that um, people can use the clout that has been uh, established through institutions like the Runnymede Trust and class to resolutely say what we know has been happening, that gentrification is something that impacts our communities and uh, makes our cities boring. I think that's something that we also, you know, uh, beyond it being a really horrific and violent process, it makes our cities boring and predictable and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. So I really hope that people listening today are inspired to, you know, be in love with their city and and to always explore more and all of that kind of stuff and, and to lend a hand to a lot of people engaged in really important struggles and fights. So uh, yeah, it's been an honor to, to write this report and um, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you so much. That's wonderful thoughts to finish with. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks, Patria. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you to everybody for attending this evening. Thank you for joining us today and please download and disseminate the report. Thanks everybody, goodbye.